First of all, thank you all for being here. I know that many of us um, sort of have reached Zoom limits over the pandemic, but for me, I'm really grateful because it's such a um, wonderful way for all of us to be able to be together regardless of socioeconomics or work situation. So um, it's a real gift. And I'm really grateful to Jim for having the foresight to continue to offer things in this way because it really does welcome people um, from all over in all different ways. So welcome um, and thank you for having me, Titus. Um, I wanna start by saying, please feel free to jump in at any time if you have a question and um, I'll do my best to try to answer it. We're gonna start by talking a little bit about the history of the United Bank offering. Um, we got one more person coming in and then we'll switch over to talking about the grant process. So if you are here mostly because you wanna hear about the UTO grant process and you have questions, feel free to go ahead and put those into the comments, but I promise we'll, we'll transition and make sure everything gets equal timing. Um, I just wanna share my screen for a minute uh, and show you one of my favorite pictures, early pictures of the United Bank offering. Um, this group of women were all studying to be deaconesses at St. Margaret's, um, which was the deaconess training school that was uh, founded and funded for many years with money from the United Bank offering as a part of Church Divinity School of the Pacific in Berkeley, California. Um, and St. Margaret's was where women who wanted to serve the church would go and be trained as deaconesses and then UTO would send them out into the world um, to do their work and equip them to do that work. Um, the reason why I like showing this picture is a lot has changed since uh, the deaconess training schools. Um, for one, women are allowed to serve in all orders of ministry and get married. So when UTO was first founded in 1883 as um, a portion of the work of the women's auxiliary, if women wanted to work for the church, they were not eligible for marriage. And once you married, you were expected to no longer work. So um, our founder, Julia Chester Emery, uh, she chose to never marry, even though she was asked several times um, because she felt so dedicated to the work that she was doing. Her sister, Mary Abbott, Emery had started the Women's Auxiliary as, a, as an outreach of the Board of Missions with the idea that the women of the church were doing so much work out in the world that they needed to be organized and they needed to have a connection to what was called the Board of Missions, which is now Executive Council. So the Women's Auxiliary evolves and becomes um, Episcopal Church Women and the United Bank Offering, which was first collected in 1883, continues to be the United Bank Offering. Um, just a quick note, the piece of our history that's interesting is when women were seated as deputies, General Convention passed a resolution in 1970 saying that gratitude is the work of the whole church and that um, every man, woman, and child was encouraged to participate in UTO and be members of the organization. And at that time we were made semi-autonomous, um, had our, began with a committee that's now a board. And now we have people who are non-binary on our board. We've had men on our board. Um, so it's a very diverse group of people. Uh, however, with that said, we do give thanks for our ties to the women in history who uh, really laid the groundwork for the work that we do today. Originally, UTO was really funded as a response to the missionary needs. The first um, collection was taken because the women at the time would send these boxes of things to missionaries and their families, um, mostly clergy and clergy families, to try to support them out in the mission field. They had sent a box of prayer books and other materials to the priest in Anvik, Alaska. And he wrote back and basically said, thanks for the, the prayer books, but I don't have a church to put them in. And the women really took this to heart and realized that they needed to think differently about mission. And so the women took up an offering, um, which allowed them to build Christ Church in Anvik, which still sits on the Iditarod, uh, Today, the Iditarod runs right in front of Christ Church Anvik. And they sent the first female missionary for the Episcopal Church to serve in Japan. Her name was Lisa Lovell, and she was a teacher in Japan. And so for many years, UTO raised money to send missionaries and to support the work they were doing. 
the bulk of which was really an education, nursing, um, and support of sort of what we would consider today social services. Um, with that said, there, um, with times, they change. The one thing that's remained constant is the United Thank Offering is a ministry of the whole church to deepen our spiritual practices of gratitude, to collect thank offerings, and to give those thank offerings away to support innovative mission and ministry in the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion. UTO is unique because we do not fund projects that already exist. It has to be something new, which means your project doesn't necessarily have to be successful in the end. The idea is to try something new, to really listen to where God is calling you and step out in faith and respond to it. And that's really been core and central to our values since that first offering was taken in 1883. Uh, the last thing I want to say about the UTO history, because it's my favorite um, story, we're spending this year celebrating Julia Chester Emery. It's the hundredth, um, the centennial of her death, which is, as you know, in the Episcopal Church, when we um, remember when people have entered into the kingdom of God, so we celebrate their feast day. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Julia Chester Emery is that, I don't know why the pictures are not loading on the website right now, um, is that Julia Chester Emery does not have any icons. She's not super well known, but she is in our, um, in our um, cycle of prayer in the Episcopal Church. So we've really been spending the year helping to tell her story better. Um, and I'll put a link to this website, which hopefully for you all will load the pictures. We're working on our web website as we transition uh, our things from being in person in Baltimore to not in person. So that some things are a little glitchy right now, but um, a couple of things that I love about Julia Chester Emery. The first is, is that um, she was the son of a sea captain and she prided herself on the fact that she had a very strong um, ability to travel. And so she went around the world twice, um, which in the early 1900s for a single woman to do was impressive in and of itself, but she also never got sick. Um, someone gave her a very fancy first aid kit, and she said that the only thing she needed out of it once was a mint to, to settle her stomach after some spicy food. Um, and she arrived in, in China at one point in the midst of, a, um, of an outbreak, um, and the doctor told her, please do not go up to visit the missionaries on the river. You'll likely, you'll likely become quite sick. And she said, write down everything I'm supposed to do so that I can go visit because that's what I'm here for. And she was able to do that without um, coming into any harm. And the other story that I like to tell about Julia Chester Emery is that she was very smart. I think sometimes we forget that these Victorian women, <laughs> um, I think we have these, this image of them that they were not headstrong or that they weren't um, forthcoming with their opinions. and. Uh, the Board of Missions at the time had made it clear they could not afford for Alaska to become a missionary district. And, and Julia thought this was the worst idea the church had ever had. But of course, Alaska should become a part of the Episcopal Church. Um, and of course, we should send missionaries. And of course, we should send a bishop. And of course, we should fund them. Because in her mind, that missionary zeal was what Christ had called us all to, right? And so she went to uh, the Women's Auxiliary and the UTO and so we need to raise the money. And so they actually endowed um, money for the Diocese of Alaska to get started. They paid the bishop's salary and all of his expenses for quite some time until the Board of Missions was able to expand to include the Diocese of Alaska. Uh, and so we have this long, long relationship with Alaska from sending airplanes. Uh, there was an airplane called the Flying Blue Box for the bishop who uh, was also a pilot. It hangs in the diocesan offices there in Alaska today. So, um, so I always love that story where she felt so compelled that Alaska should be a part of the church, um, that she made it happen. So that's a little bit of the history of UTO. Um, obviously, UTO stopped sending missionaries over time um, and then moved into other arenas. Now, the United Bank Offering really believes that God is doing something important and special in your communities and that our job is to um, raise thankful hearts so that we can come alongside you and support those innovative mission and ministry projects um, that you're doing in your, in your local context. So with that said, 
Um, the focus on criteria has changed throughout time. Um, there was a time where there was no focus to the UTO grant process. And then in the 1970s, they realized it was important to give people some direction. If we're going to be innovative, we need to sometimes put some fences around what that looks like. Um, the United Think Offering continues to be um, one, if not the only source of grant funds for churches and in both the Episcopal Church and Anglican Communion to build buildings, renovate buildings, buy vehicles. And so we stay committed to that um, tradition, which is, is very old for UTO. Uh, we, are, um, we have our focus and criteria available now, which I'm gonna share my screen so you can see it. Um, and I have it in both English and Spanish. If we have Spanish speakers, I can flip back and forth. Oh, I'm sorry, before I switch, does anyone have questions about the history of UTO or anything? that I breezed by a little too fast. All right, we'll see. Now I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna start with the English, but I can switch to the Spanish if there are questions, because I know sometimes seeing it in your own language is a little bit easier, even with the amazing translation talents of Glenda McQueen. Um, so the focus and criteria is, is up now. The application or the application and application materials um, for 2023 will, will be available. Um, we have a workshop in July, which you're welcome to sign up for. I'll put the link in the chat in just a few minutes. Um, at that workshop in July, the application will, will be released first to those who come to the workshop, and then it will be available throughout the fall and then, then is due. Um, over the course of a few months, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so we have sort of a, a, a dual system set up for the Anglican communion and for people who would like to submit an application in a language other than English. So I'll talk about that in a second if there's interest. Um, so the focus for 2023 is on um, the gospel, Matthew 25. I'm sure you all remember that one quite well, right? When the person says, when Jesus says to the person, you know, thank you for feeding me, visiting me in prison, taking care of me, sheltering me, giving me clothes. And the person says, well, when did I do that? And Jesus says, when you did it for the least of these. And so recognizing um, that God has a preferential option for the poor and those in need, the United Bank Offering Board um, is committed to um, grant foci over the next three years in the spirit of that scripture verse beginning with uh, a grant cycle focusing on the incarceration crisis. So I know a lot of people have already said to me, we don't do prison ministry. Um, you don't have to do prison ministry. Uh, this is about, as we know, um, perfect. Sorry, I'm just checking the chat. Um, we know that the worldwide incarceration crisis will not be fixed simply by dealing with prisons but will be um, addressed dealing with things like preventative programs and intervention, prisoner support and outreach, um, prison reform work or post-prison re-entry projects. We know that this is a growing edge for us in the Episcopal Church, which is exactly where UTO often wants to fund, right? We, we wanna fund those, those things that are new and happening out on the edges. Um, so funding range, there is a cap now on UTO grants. You can ask for $1,000 to $55,000. However, in cases of extreme need, you can ask for up to $100,000. And there will be a way to do that in the application process that's fairly clear. We fund new ministries. Um, as I said, we do not fund things you're currently doing. But if you want to take a program into a new direction, um, you can certainly apply for the new direction of the program. Currently, we accept one grant application per diocese within the Episcopal Church. We accept a second application from any diocese of the Episcopal Church that receives funding from the general convention budget. And if you're not sure if you're one of those, let me know. And we receive two applications from each province of the Anglican communion that has five or more dioceses um, within it. And also within provinces of the Anglican communion, provinces can apply for a project that's called a provincial grant, which spans more than one diocese. So the idea of encouraging dioceses within provinces to work together um, is what those are for. 
Okay, so UTO funds are for the mission and ministry of the Episcopal Church. Therefore, we do not fund any organization that does not have Episcopal oversight. And this is really important because um, I think in the past, UTO had been pretty squishy about what Episcopal oversight means. Now we're much clearer and in line with other um, presiding bishops granting organizations. The way I always describe it is to think about Episcopal relief and development. They're a separate 501c3. However, the presiding bishop sits, um, it, regardless of who it is, sits on the board of directors as the chair. And they also um, report to executive council. So there's a lot of things that UTO applications will not fund and a lot of things we will fund. Um, the way I always sort of sum it up is to think about the fact that, um, to think about what happens to the thing you wanna buy. Does it disappear or does it, exist forever. So uh, we can't pay for anything that you're going to give away, but we can certainly pay for anything uh, that you will use over and over again um, or keep at your church. We will also pay for staffing, which is often not the case for nonprofits, religious nonprofit granting organizations. Again, brick and mortar um, vehicles and all those sorts of things. So I'm just going to switch hopefully to the Spanish because I see that Glenda's interpreting. So um, while we're looking at the Spanish, I'm gonna explain the process for those um, who are either in the Anglican communion or who are um, wanting to apply in a language other than English. We will accept an application in any language that is of the approved Episcopal church languages. So, um, so in this case, on our screen is Spanish, you can apply in Spanish and we will help you get it translated into English. Um, but because we do that, there is an earlier deadline for both the Anglican communion and those who would like translation services. Um, we will provide the translation services, they just take time. So we ask for those to be submitted earlier. Additionally, we have found that um, one of the things, sorry, one of the things that's important to the United Bank offering is we get that most organizations and churches cannot afford a professional grant writer. So intrinsic to the system is a lot of help. So if you're a first time grant writer, we have um, so much help to get you through the process. Um, even if you're not, we will help you. Uh, there's webinars every month, there's webinars in different languages, webinars for different regions of Africa that will be announced um, later this summer. So we really wanna help you succeed. And one of the things we found is if we have an earlier deadline for the Anglican communion and for those needing translation services, we can help make sure your application is complete. Um, we know that it's really hard sometimes to track down a primate to get a signature. So if we have these two deadlines, it gives us time. And um, the wonderful folks on the global partnership staff are amazing at helping me and helping applicants also make sure those applications are complete. Uh, we were seeing over the past few years that Anglican community applications were not getting funded, not because they weren't good projects, but because they were not complete applications. So the goal is to make sure that everybody can get a complete application in that's within the focus and criteria. Um, in a perfect world, we'd be able to fund everybody. Uh, we can only fund what we receive. So, um, so if you're not currently participating in UTO, we hope you will, because every penny that's given to UTO goes to the grant process. In the 1970s, um, as UTO became semi-autonomous, the women also set up a trust fund that pays for all of the expenses of the United Bank offering. So every penny given to UTO is given away, uh, which is quite unique among granting organizations. And I can also send you the link to where all of these focus and criteria pieces live. I'll put that in the chat. So I'm going to pause here and.